Hello everyone, welcome back. My name's Holden, and this is my January, or should I say, Japanuary, or January in Japan, reading wrap-up. It's like quite a bit into February now, like I think it's the second week of February, possibly the, now the third week, um, considering I might not get this out right away. Um, but there's a good reason for that, and that is I recorded this whole video, uh, and then the whole thing was just out of focus. So, here we are again. For those who are not aware, what is often called Japanuary or January in Japan here on Booktube, but also Book Talk and Goodreads and Instagram and anywhere that people who read congregate, the occasion refers to an effort made throughout the month of January to read more Japanese fiction and to read Japanese fiction throughout the month. As did many people, as I've seen lots of Japanuary and January in Japan wrap ups and summaries on YouTube and Instagram. So I'm just adding my texts to this growing canon today. I read five Japanese texts in January. Now, one of those texts was not by a Japanese writer, and it wasn't originally written in Japanese, so you're probably wondering why I'm including that. You'll see. But to start us off, it's business as usual, and I read Japanese fiction throughout January, but particularly in those first few weeks in which I was trying to average at least two books a week, which... <laughs> It was a bit ambitious in hindsight, but we got it done. But the first text that I read in 2024, and the first Japanese text that I read for January in Japan, was Snakes and Earrings by Hitomi Kanehara. Now, if you've been following me for a minute, you would know that I had actually talked at length, like extensive length, about this text. There's like an over 20 minute video off on my channel. There'll be the first link in the description. And I've also blogged about it on my blog over at WordPress as well. I won't reiterate all the things I said in that review, in that blog post, because a lot of it's not super interesting. A lot of it does have to do with kind of the technical side of composition and translation and writing. Not really much discussion about the plot and the themes. But as I said in that video, in that blog post, the story is fairly straightforward. It follows a teenage girl, which I think she's about 19. Her name is Louie and she's kind of gone off the rails a little bit. She's got this exciting new lifestyle that's very different from her kind of good girl aesthetic that she had going on. Um, she's now got piercings and she's gonna get tattoos and she's got a boyfriend who is like this punk hardcore guy and she's in a love triangle. In fact, it actually gets quite a bit more intense than that as she dabbles with alcoholism and anorexia and being an accessory to murder, you know, all the all the big A's. It's quite thematically heavy, and if you did see my previous video, you'll remember that it's not it's not composed great. It's not well written by any means. The prose is nothing to write home about. But at the end of the day I did find this text enjoyable. I that like I said in my review, it was well paced, it was interesting, there was never a dull moment. As far as if I was to kind of like rate it on quality, doesn't score very high, but was I intrigued? Was I entertained? Sure. I'm confident in saying sure, yes, I was. But just like three of the five texts that I'm going to be talking about in this video, Snakes and Earrings was an Akutagawa Prize winner, which is Japan's most prestigious literary award as of right now, or at least a lot of Akutagawa Prize winners get translated into English and other languages and kind of celebrated, shared around the world. And so I did theorise a little bit, I touched on a little bit why I think this may have been so critically acclaimed despite not being very good. Uh, and I think it may have had something to do with the authenticity of the narrative voice and how it sounds like an annoying <laughs> teenager. I think I can see perhaps the road that critics went down to award it such high esteem. So it's an interesting read nonetheless, and I do recommend it to people who find that kind of thing interesting and think it sounds like the kind of thing they would like, but it is an out there novel. But I'm, I'm glad that I read it. But with that, um, we are now moving right along to the second text of the month, which was Kaori Fujino's Nails and Eyes, which although is kind of named similarly, has a similar naming convention, is very different. It's actually a collection of three short stories that all have this very disturbing, unsettling, skin-crawling theme to them, or at least two of them do. One of them is very tonally different, but we'll get to that. So Nails and Eyes, again, is another Kutagawa Prize winner from about 10 years later. I think it was a 2013 winner. 
and it is actually quite good. I don't read a lot of short stories, but the short story format is quite big in Japan, and I think we have Ryunosuke Akutagawa to thank for that. He was kind of the pioneer of the Japanese short story, and therefore makes sense a lot of Akutagawa Prize winners kind of follow in that literary tradition. But one thing that this challenge uh, did allow me to do was read more collections of short stories, and the first two stories in this like small collection I really found good. <laughs> Good might be a, a tricky word to use here because they were both very disturbing and really made my skin crawl, like I said. So the titular story and the longest story in this collection is Nails and Eyes. And this is told from the perspective of a woman remembering when she was a child and her father got engaged to a much younger woman after her, fa her mother died. The mother's death was really quite suspicious and weird. In fact, I've seen some people speculate online that it they kind of got the feeling it was foul play, and I understand where that feeling comes from, but my mind's not made up on that theory yet. I don't know if I agree. Regardless, what is undisputable is that the death of that mother was very traumatic for the whole family, but particularly that young girl. And so this complicates things when the new stepmother, although they're not married yet, the woman and the, the girl's father, uh, is a little bit negligent. And of course, she's a little bit young. I think she's in her early 20s. And as someone in their early 20s, like, yeah, no, I can't take care of myself, let alone somebody's kid. But yeah, that really complicates things and I think it does inadvertently, perhaps through an act of cruelty or perhaps just through an act of negligence, lead to the re-traumatization of that child and that child's kind of descent into madness. <laughs> but similarly to that first story, the second story, What Shoko Forgets, uh, is much much shorter but is also really disturbing and disturbing in a way that makes me kind of like literally kind of like squeeze my eyes shut. Nothing really kind of makes my skin crawl like these stories and I think it's got something to do with what they don't show us, like what is implied in addition to what is shown and what is seen. And this second story is a really good example of the terror of it being from what we don't know and what is implied. It reminds me of kind of, I think it's Henry James, The Turn of the Screw, this kind of Victorian short story about the, the terror of like what is not explicitly shown or told. But basically, what Shoko forgets takes place in the rehabilitation ward of a hospital and there's a woman who I would assume is in her 80s because her granddaughter is in her 30s. As is most of the people on this rehabilitation ward, but there is like one young man, like a man in his 20s, who is very well liked, very helpful, very cheery. No one knows what's quite wrong with him and why he's been in rehab for so long, but it's not our place to ask questions. He's just there. And he's set out as kind of very genuine, caring person who does want to make the lives of people on the, the ward and in the hospital better. But slowly, kind of throughout the story, we find out that, oh, he may actually be absolutely despicable. And for the first bit of the story, we definitely do get the impression that he's, he's a good guy. He's helpful. He's helping people. But slowly, more and more is revealed. And Shoko remembers things, and Shoko notices things. Shoko is kind of the grandmother, although that's not her real name. And these kind of little pieces that the reader will put together to discover that, potentially, the worst possible thing that this man could be up to, he's up to. Although it's never explicitly said, it's only kind of, you're only really limited by your imagination what you think he's doing after dark. I'll touch really briefly on the third and final story in that collection, which is called Minute Fears. Because, although it's fine, like it's written well enough, I, I thought it was okay, no complaints, it's very tonally different from the other stories in this collection. What I mean by that is there's no disturbing, skin-crawling emotion solicited by it. And that comes down to like what kind of is explored in the novel. It does explore this mother and son relationship, but in this way that it's kind of about being a young mother and this woman she had her son fairly young so she's still trying to go out and do things and like go to her friend's weddings and go out with her friends and, and have her career but the son is at home and is still relies on her a lot so it's, it's more so about that than it is about the creepy part of this which is that the, the boy believes that there's like a ghost haunting him that lives in the playground near his house which uh, i mean yeah creepy maybe if you're six but like not really creepy in the same way the other two stories are creepy and very totally different and a lot of people noticed that in their reviews and said 
don't know why this is here. Like, it's it's a fine story, but, like, after what I just read, it was really odd. <laughs> it was a really odd placement. All right, but the third text I read in January, for January in Japan, was Idol Burning by Rin Usami. Again, another Akutagawa Prize winner. So we've had some, some big titles this month. So Idol Burning is about a teenage otaku girl called Akari, and she is obsessed with this idol or oshi called Masaki Ueno, who's in this J-pop band or something. Something like that. He's a musician, actor, factotum, he does it all. You know, we know this story. We know teenage girls and their pop stars, and this is a tale as old as time, really. But this one's a little bit different because it deals with a very modern issue, and that is of cancel culture. So right at the beginning of this novel, Masaki is accused of assaulting a female fan, and this is not an accusation he denies. In fact, he comes out quite, like, right away and says, Yeah, man, my bad. I did do that. Oops. And yeah, an interesting response, but one that kind of makes sense when we get to learn more about this idol through Akari, who Akari's always kind of keeping up to date on Masaki and what he's doing. She watches press conferences and interviews and reads articles and collects all the music and watches all the videos and has a blog in which she updates everyone on everything Masaki related. And we kind of, at least in my opinion, get the context that he's a little bit sick of fame. <laughs> He's a little bit sick of just all of this. He's been a, an idol or a public figure uh, in the entertainment industry since he was really quite young. And he just doesn't care anymore. And I think he's lashing out with a little bit of a manifestation of this. As a result, um, the band that he's in starts to kind of break up and they announce they're doing their final tour and his popularity plummets because well people don't like that he assaulted the fan but people also don't like that he broke up the band um so he's kind of public enemy number one and you would think that for Akari whose whole life has kind of been circled around this person and she doesn't really do very well at her job or at school doesn't have very good grades or any ambitions it's just kind of worshipping this idol I was really expecting her to lose her mind. But she keeps quite a level head through all of this, which in my opinion is quite a bizarre choice, right? I, I think it's not really what I wanted to see from this character. I wanted to see a descent into madness. I wanted to see her lose it. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe I'm a sadist. But surprisingly, Akari keeps very positive throughout this. She updates the blog saying that, you know, no matter what, we'll still support Masaki. She, you know, still buys the music, still loves him, doesn't have any kind of conflicting feelings about it. You know, th this kind of incident doesn't challenge her to challenge her, like, idol worship and, and think about perhaps maybe it's not a good idea to worship, like, people because they are human and they make mistakes. But we don't really see that either. I don't really see a whole lot of character development from her at all. I would have liked to have seen something. Whether that was kind of her lose her mind and track Masaki down and like slit his throat, or if it's she becomes reformed and decides that this idol stuff is just for kids, I'm going to grow up now, this is my ticket to get out of this kind of fandom and go get a real job. But she doesn't do either of those, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I kind of just was left wanting a bit more, but that's not to say I didn't like it. I really did like this. Okay, we're getting through this. It's going to be a long video, but the second last, or the fourth, Japanese text I read for January was People From My Neighborhood by Miko Kawakami. Now, I'm sure everyone knows Miko Kawakami. If you know anything about Japanese literature from the last... 10, 15 years, um, she's a bit of a, a star, really. She's done Heaven and Breasts and Eggs and Miss Ice Sandwich, which I read in December, and, like, these are all kind of celebrated. You know, she's one of the best. I was expecting good things. But it was a little bit of a tricky read for me, and I think the, the, the moment it set in that this was not really for me, wasn't really my cup of tea, was when I noticed that I did not... <laughs> have the desire to pick this up like I did with the other texts, the other three that I read. Like, I was thinking, you know, I've got to get through people from my neighbourhood so I can get on to the next text, and that kind of didn't bring any joy. That kind of also almost brought frustration, like, oh my god, we've got to do that. <laughs> Here we go. And, yeah, that's not a good sign. It's not a good sign to be dreading to read your book as if it's homework. So at that point, I think it became clear that this wasn't for me. 
Maybe it was because of the short story format was not something that I ever gravitated towards, or maybe the magical realism genre wasn't something I ever really gravitated towards, or maybe I just wasn't awake enough for it. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of characters and a lot of things going on throughout this. This details an entire neighborhood, from everyone from um, the school principal to the corner store owner to the taxi driver to the childhood best friend to the mayor to the doctors. Like, everyone's there, and everyone has like their own quirks and oddities and their own story, and it's all packed into quite a short collection. So there's a lot going on. It's very stimulating. <laughs> At the end of the day, my very biased opinion is that it was just okay. Like I'm, I'm in no rush to give it another shot. I found it quite tough to finish. Um, just because it didn't align with my own personal interests. Like I'm not saying that you won't enjoy it or anyone else won't enjoy it. Plenty of people did. Like I saw the Goodreads reviews. It was well received. I want to give a little bit more context as to what this story or this collection of stories is about. But it's just about everything. It's about a whole neighborhood and the things in the neighborhood are in their magical realism. So you don't know what is kind of real, you don't know what is fantasy, and you don't know what is magic or just a hallucination or a dream or just like child's play. It's really quite cryptic with the information that we have. Um, we just know there's a lot of quirky things going on, a lot of quirky characters. Um, sometimes really silly things are actually quite funny. There, there are some funny moments in this, but there's also no linear story throughout and the stories themselves aren't even really kind of like narratives they're kind of just vignettes they're kind of poems or moments or emotions or experiences that depict a person or a moment in the neighborhood so it's it's experimental i guess you could say speaking of not being a huge fan the last text is actually the text that um, brought this whole thing to a close because I just was in such a reading slump after reading it that I didn't want to read anything else for the remainder of the month. And that was Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica O. Uh, Jessica O. Oh, probably. I should probably look this stuff up before I make the video. But that's on me. Sorry. Now, if you're from Australia, you probably know already that Jessica O oh is not a Japanese writer. She's an Australian writer. And this is a celebrated Australian novella that came out recently and you would be right all of that is correct so why am I mentioning it here well I'm mentioning it here because I put it on my reading list for January in Japan because I thought this book takes place in Japan for the most part and it, it does like, I'll be real like a lot of this book does take place in Japan so from my understanding before I went into this novella was that this is the story of a mother and daughter who take a trip together to Tokyo I don't know what I was expecting maybe they kind of become closer to each other, or they bond, or they learn things about each other, or they f they fix past traumas, they, they work through their problems together, I don't know. I was expecting something, anything. It's very, very plotless, this. It, there's no conflict. Um, it's just a lot of pottering around, unfortunately. Like, the parts that are in Japan are, are lacking kind of the description. You know, often the narrator will say things like, then we went to the park, well, you're in Tokyo. And like a lot of this is about creating the ambiance of being somewhere new. That's like the appeal of this. So what park in Tokyo? Where? I don't want to see another generic description of a cherry blossom. Like, like give me something to imagine beyond just like memories of your childhood and your ex-boyfriend. And that one time you house sat for this professor. Like, and another kind of memories from youth that don't seem to be connected to whatever's going on in the present Maybe I'm an idiot, maybe I missed something and this is all connected and all makes perfect sense, but I like to think that I'm a bit more perceptive than that. <laughs> like if there was something like hiding in plain sight that I would have seen it, it doesn't read like that. It reads like a waste of my time. I'm bitter about this because I was really disappointed. I wanted to see kind of this mother and daughter bonding experience in Japan. I thought that would be really interesting, but there's really no bonding. I don't think the relationship between mother and daughter is stronger afterwards or even more distant. I think the the mother is quite old. She's probably in her late 70s or, or 80s. She doesn't really do much. She kind of just like, they eat at a restaurant, they go to an art gallery, they go back to the hotel at like 2 p.m. and they stay there. This could have taken place anywhere in the world. This could have taken place in Melbourne. This could have taken place in Munich. Like, why was like the big selling point and the thing that you, you you read when you look at the synopsis online or you read on the blurb at the back cover of the book about kind of this journey 
in Tokyo. We see nothing. <laughs> and so I did kind of feel like I wasted my time because this was not January in Japan. This was January in kind of like what seems to be like a, a slightly overrated, critically acclaimed recent novel. Just so happens to have some parts that just so happen to be in Japan. Although there's probably about eight sentences in the whole novel that really give the uh, impression that they're in Japan. I'm ragging on this, but it wasn't it wasn't terrible. Like I did give it two stars along with people from my neighborhood. Again, there's nothing wrong with the writing. It's it's very rare that I encounter writing in a published novel that I turn my nose up at. Um, and even like I said in my last video, bad writing isn't necessarily like a death sentence. Like if the novel is interesting and I'm engaged, but I wasn't, you know, you could have the most beautiful prose, but if I don't care about the characters or what's happening, or I don't want to see what happens next, then I, well, then what are we doing here? Like, that's kind of really the basics of, like, novel writing. Um, even if it's a deeply personal novel, even if it's based off life experiences, I still think you need to give readers something to care about and not just kind of write this bland literary fiction that is just award bait. But yeah. Basically, that's it. That's January in Japan. That's all the Japanese novels and Japanese adjacent novels that didn't actually end up being that relevant uh, that I read in January. I feel like this has taken like the community by storm recently. So if you found this interesting and you want more Japanese book recommendations, I would definitely kind of do a keyword search here on YouTube and look for other people's videos, other people's reading wrap ups where they're talking about their January or January in Japan picks and their experiences. Uh, but, you know, t take what I say with a grain of salt. This is very biased and based solely on, like, what I like, um, which is not very much. Like, I think my Goodreads average rating is, like, less than three. So if I like something, you better believe that it's pretty bloody good. That being said, thank you for watching. I imagine this will be a long video. I had a, a lot to say, but I'll see you next time. I've got something cooking, something in the works. So stick around. But thank you. I'll see you later. Goodbye.